Welcome to season two of Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism and euphoria, and ultimately humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. Okay, to be fair, the first season focused mostly on the darker aspects of this time, and there was little euphoria as the world descended into darkness. But now we are back again in the autumn of 1918, the months October, November, and December, and the world is perhaps once again an oyster that might have a pearl, carrying the promise of better things to come. So, let me do it again. This is Between Two Wars Season 2, a chronological summary of the interwar years, where we cover the zeitgeist, the culture, the technology, the art, the sports, and much more in the era when, for better or for worse, humanity ushered in modern times. I'm Indy Nidell. It is autumn 1918. As October begins, the world is not aware that the world war is soon coming to its end. Bulgaria left the war in late September, but the other three central powers are still standing. Though make no mistake, all of their high commands know as October begins, the war is no longer winnable. The Ottoman Empire is now isolated and the collapse of the Macedonian front means millions of allied soldiers can march north into central Europe unopposed. By November 3rd, the Ottomans and Austro-Hungarians have signed armistices, leaving only Germany fighting. But as German Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff said, we cannot fight the entire world. The Great War ends on November 11th, but while people throughout the world rejoice that the Great War is over, war certainly is not over. In Eastern Europe, as new nations spring up everywhere, so do new wars, especially in and around Russia, which is now at civil war. And even where there isn't immediate war, there is still civil unrest, like in Germany, which is now in the throes of a revolution as the monarchy falls and a republic is declared. Over all this upheaval, like a dark shroud, the Spanish flu pandemic is disrupting life and killing millions across the globe. This autumn alone, over 10 million people, perhaps as many as 30 million, now succumb to the disease. Now, it could be easy to see analogies between the upheavals of the 21st century and the times after World War I. Partisan politics ripping nations apart, ethnic disparity and conflict, violent street protests, growing extremism, unresolved geopolitical conflicts, economic turmoil, and of course, a global pandemic. But such analogies fall short of how different these times are. First of all, in 1918, the entire world is in mourning. People are still dying in the follow-on wars, but almost everyone in the nations that fought the Great War has already lost a loved one a family member or a friend, or many of them to the four years of carnage. When the flu pandemic rages, this loss becomes true for literally every family on the planet. It is also a world deeply, deeply divided by social class and poverty. In 2020, around 20% 20 of the world's population is living in destitution. In 1918, that number is 80%. In most countries, there are few and even at best very mild worker protection laws, labor insurance, or any state financed social services. The services provided by religious organizations or other voluntary aid have long been overwhelmed by the wars and the pandemic. While the wealth gap in 2020 is still growing in absolute numbers, the wealth gap in 1918 has much deeper impact. There is not a large middle class but a huge class of industrial and agrarian workers, and all three depend on the goodwill of the tiny minority in the dominant upper classes. And even that is only true for rural and urban areas in the developing world, mostly in Europe, North America, and parts of East Asia. South America is still very much a feudal world with a minority of landowners and their dependents, no longer slaves, but for all practical purposes, living in serfdom. This was also the situation in Russia and Eastern Europe until the revolutions of 1917. Well, to be fair, that is still the situation in Russia because whatever intentions the Bolsheviks might have, so far, they have created little, if any change, only war. Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, 
Most of Southeast Asia are all under colonial dominion, effectively leaving the majority of the world's population subject to the whim and will of faraway foreign powers that seek to exploit resources and labor at minimum cost with little regard for the locals who actually have to suffer the consequences. But even in the West, many freedoms like, like suffrage are patchy at best, and most countries' women still don't have the vote. Entire ethnicities are locked out from participating in society, and in many places, especially in the US, racial inequality is complete. Outside the US and a very few European countries, there is no freedom of the press or opinion, Access to running water and electricity is far from the norm, even in large developed cities. And even there, the vast majority of people do not even have their own toilets. The telephone is four decades old, but is still a luxury item, with entire regions not yet connected to the grid. Obviously, there is no internet and no television. Heck, there isn't even radio, but thanks to the Great War, that is about to change. As we covered in season one, 1918, is the year that radio becomes a practical invention. But although the first tests of music and spoken sound are being transmitted, there are still not any shows to listen to. Now, although there is no broadcast media, in 1918, the cinema is already the go-to place for entertainment and news in moving image. It has been since well before the World War. All across Europe and North America, more and more other parts of the world, cinemas ranging from proper movie theaters in the cities to a converted barn or basement in the countryside have sprung up over the last two decades. It's a growing phenomenon that will continue to explode through the 1920s, and by 1930, over 80% of Americans will go to the cinema at least once a week. To meet the demand for new films, a whole new industry is being stomped out of the ground. In America, that industry is heavily dominated by the patent monopolies of inventor and entrepreneur Thomas Edison and his associates. Until now, this has stopped other players from emerging as real film studios, but now in 1918, that is about to change. This autumn, Warner Brothers expands further from film distribution into actual production. The four Warner Brothers have been exhibiting films since 1903, and by 1907 had opened movie theaters. Eventually, they owned hundreds of titles and opened a small production base in Culver City, California. Their first actual production, released earlier this year while the war was still raging, is My Four Years in Germany, and is based on the experiences of James Gerard, the American ambassador to Berlin during the war. It is an anti-German propaganda piece and grosses $1.5 million, an enormous sum for 1918. Buoyed by their success, they purchase property on Sunset Boulevard, and Warner Brothers West Coast Studios is born. They are the first independent studios, something made possible not only by the success of my four years in Germany, but also the landmark court case, United States versus the Motion Picture Patents Company. That company, also known as the Edison Trust, was founded in 1908 by Thomas Edison and nine other owners of film-related patents. This trust controlled the patents that pretty much dominated the film industry. Cameras, film stock, projectors, even the Latham Loop, the main feature of virtually all cameras in use. They controlled the industry, charging high fees and asserting their patent rights against independent producers by frequent litigation. They had a real monopoly of all aspects of the film business. Eastman Kodak, for example, was part of the trust, and they owned the patent on raw film stock and only sold it to other members. Projector patents only allowed theaters to screen trust members' films, and so forth. In 1912, the Department of Justice brought suit against the trust, and the court ordered that the trust be dissolved. The trust appealed to the Supreme Court. The process of appeals and other related cases took years, but in January this year, the patent of the Latham Loop is ruled invalid. And this has been the keystone of the trust's patent structure. And in June, they withdraw their appeal. The US film industry is now finally open for free competition. But of course, the booming of the film industry isn't just limited to North America. Even in war-torn Germany, the show is still going on. In fact, Berlin is one of the film capitals of the world, together with Paris, London, and New York. 
In Berlin, Ernst Lubisch makes his mark as a director in 1918 with the release of Die Augen der Mumie Ma, The Eyes of the Mummy, starring Pola Negri. Young Pola, a German actress of Polish ethnicity, will play a central part in both the global movie industry and the politics connected to it through the 1920s and the 1930s. Already now, she is caught up in the post-war German drama as she becomes a first-hand witness to street protests, political violence, and desperate poverty and hunger. While she at first goes back home, now in the newly declared Polish Second Republic, and becomes a Polish citizen, like many professionals caught in the mess that is now Europe, there is an idea growing in her mind. Go West. For while the war has interrupted developments in the aughts and early teens that seemed to promise a new, better world, in America, a land much less touched by the war, especially physically, this commercial revolution never stopped. One aspect of that is a revolution in food production and preparation, both on an industrial and domestic scale. The growth of mass transportation by railway and the faster times for international transport by sea now gradually enable mass production even of perishable goods. Utility companies, especially the electricity suppliers, have set their eyes on getting into households by electrifying the home. To speed up that process, there is a hard push to support the development of many things that a hundred years later are standard in our homes, like dishwashers, washing machines, electric stoves, ovens, and toasters. Yes, toasters. While several of those other appliances are yet to be made practical, the toaster was invented in 1909. It's not yet pop-up toasters, but some people can now toast their sliced bread for breakfast although they have to slice it themselves. Packaged pre-sliced bread is still a concept of the future. Now, the way we prepare food also influences the ingredients we need and how they need to react to our cooking. In that vein, this year, Velveeta processed cheese, a cheese that can easily be sliced and melted and is still popular in the US 100 years later, is invented in America by Swiss immigrant Emil Frey, working for the Monroe Cheese Company. He already had one hit in 1889 after his bosses challenged him to reinvent Bismarck cheese, which was imported from Europe, but often spoiled by the time it reached the US. The soft and spreadable Liederkranz he invents soon becomes wildly popular. And now Fry has a second soon to be hit. After mostly experimenting at home on his stove with Swiss and other cheese scraps, Fry comes up with a product whose texture is not only unlike any other cheese, but so velvety that he called it Velveeta. Now, if you melt many real cheeses, the oil separates because you create a state where the proteins, caseins, don't mix with water. Fry wants to make a cheese that will smoothly melt, and adding sodium citrate, as Fritz Settler and Walter Gerber had earlier demonstrated, allows him to melt cheese smoothly and form it into the familiar Velveeta block without the oily leftover you get from melting many regular cheeses. And it's delicious. It's Colby Swiss and cheddar blended all together. In two years, Charles Streit will patent the pop-up toaster and the world of cheese on toast will reach new heights just 17 years after the airplane was invented. Yep, we had mechanical flight 17 years before we had pop-up toasters. And side note, Velveeta today is labeled a pasteurized prepared cheese product. But the promise of more easily made food, radio, cinema, and peace means little to the families mourning their lost fathers, brothers, and sons. The Great War has left some three million women widowed and an estimated six million children without a father. Their stories are varied and could fill multiple books, and do fill multiple books, but one thing stands out, the realization that their families are changed forever. Elsie Bennett, a young Australian schoolgirl, lost her father in 1917. On Armistice Day, her school organizes a Thanksgiving service, and when all the children are asked to stand up to sing God Save the King, Elsie refuses. She tells the headmaster that all the other girls' and boys' daddies will be coming home now, but hers never will again. 
But it isn't just maudlin children's stories. Widows face terrible poverty. Yes, most of the warring nations do offer war widow pensions, but these hardly ever reach average wage levels. And that is without counting the mounting inflation taking hold across the world. Alongside wounded veterans, some will decide to take action against the meager state support. In December, 10,000 widows and maimed ex-soldiers marched to the war ministry in Berlin to demand their government give more than empty gestures which thank them for their sacrifice. There's really no sugarcoating it. The world of 1918, the world they fought for, is a bloody mess. Wars, poverty, and disease are pummeling the world, and yet somehow humanity carries on, not just coping, but creating new opportunities, describing the world around us in new forms of art, and inventing things that make life easier. Some of these improvements are even based on things first made to fulfill our most destructive impulses during the war. Others, because it was there and needed to be done, and yet others, just for fun, to try to see, depict, or describe the world in another way, to preserve the moments of our lives for ourselves, our friends, our societies, and posterity, to create machines, heck, to create flavors not found in nature merely for our enjoyment, to make life that one little bit better. That is as much a part of what defines us as human as our impulses to fight and to burn and to destroy. If those brief headlines at the start of this episode left you wanting more and you managed to somehow miss Between Two Wars Season 1, there are links below and there's probably a bunch of them appearing around my face right now. Sort of like Season 1 holiness of some sort. It is the Time Ghost Army that makes all of our shows possible and our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Bill Breadbenner. Be like Bill and join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Now, some of you might remember that season one always ended with a different form of toast. See you next time. Mm. You look really good, Astrid. Thank you. Mm. You make them better than me. It's not Velveeta, though. <laughs>